Why did you want to write a biography of Chavez? Well, I think for millions of people around the world, Hugo Chavez represented a kind of new hope after a, a very grim de decade, the decade of the 90s when people were being assaulted and crucified by the policies of the IMF, and when socialism itself was in question after the fall of Eastern Europe, a new current of thought emerged, a new current which was anti-capitalist, defiant of imperialism, and which seemed to coincide with the rise of a new movement. After all, Seattle was November 1999, Cochabamba, the water war, was just at the beginning of 2000. In the same year, the Ecuadorian indigenous movement began to rise up. And then Chavez, who actually came to the presidency at the end of 1998, but his language, his appearance, he was clearly a new force with a new language and, and a new way of articulating the hopes and aspirations of the anti-capitalist movement. So people from, from Seattle, in the, in, from North America to the south of the Latin American continent and beyond, people saw in Chavez uh, somebody who, who, who corresponded to a new wave of revolutionary thinking. He used the word revolution, he denounced neoliberalism, he took, went to the UN, uh, spoke at the podium immediately after Bush and sniffed and said, it smells of sulphur around here, which won him a huge international following instantaneously. And then a little bit more when he sent cheap, ga cheap oil to the Bronx. You know, so he was a man who knew how to operate in an international context. And, uh, and therefore he was a really key figure, I think, who expressed the, the hopes, the aspirations and, the, and a new kind of vision which connected with people right across the world. He was a really important figure. Chavez's background is really very important to understanding his impact. You see, Venezuela was dominated for 45 years by people you might describe as professional politicians. They wore suits, they wore ties, they belonged to a very, uh, very tight political system which operated on the basis of patronage, corruption, and excluded the vast majority of ordinary Venezuelans. When he came to power, when he, when he stood as a candidate in 97 to 98, the white middle classes used to call him ugly. Now, that wasn't an aesthetic judgment, but a social judgment, because his face had the craggy features of somebody with, a, with an indigenous background. Um, he, his speech was full of quips and anecdotes. He comes from the Llanos, from the plains in the, in the, uh, in the west of uh, Venezuela. And the Llaneros are famous for singing lots of songs, telling lots of stories, but having a kind of reserve until they know you, and then they are endless sources of quips and anecdotes. So when Chavez came to power and the, and the white middle classes saw, you know, spoke of him with contempt, he was ugly, and then he got up on platforms and he would sing songs and talk about playing. He always talked about playing, you know, there's a game you play with bottle tops like marbles and he'd always talk about that now for somebody outside that's meaningless but for the people he was speaking to the the majority of Venezuelans for the first time after 10 years of brutal economic measures which left 65 percent of Venezuelans in poverty according to UN statistics suddenly he was a political leader who looked and sounded like them and he built on that very cleverly he was a soldier um, and um, his his first appearance in Venezuelan politics in a public sense was on the 4th of February 92 when he led a coup which failed. Actually, it was a pretty badly organized coup altogether and it lasted less than 24 hours. But in a kind of attack of stupidity, the then president said to Chavez, look, you better go on television and tell your people to demobilize and lay down their arms. He spoke 129 words in that broadcast and it probably sealed Venezuela's future because he went on, he said, the coup is over. And then he added two words, por ahora, for now. And, and that was enough to say to people, we'll be back. And por ahora began to appear on all the walls of Venezuela, graffitied, you know. That was his first impact. And that at a very low point in Venezuela when, you know, the economic measures taken against the majority were really ferocious. And that's how he made his mark. And when he came to politics and became president, he did so with a clear relationship with the mass of ordinary people, but outside the conventional political system. 
That's why he was so significant and why his background explains why now, a year after his death and after everything that's happened, people still identify with him. He came to power with a promise. Venezuela is oil rich, but the wealth, the, 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 the income from Venezuela's oil, only 1% of it had reached the state until the end of the 90s. So his first promise was to use oil uh, to to charge a reasonable royalty of 30%, and with that 30%, to fund welfare and social programs which would somehow recoup the, the losses that people had, the, the majority of people had had, had had in the course of the 90s. Um, he was, his, his, his decision to nationalize oil provoked the rage and ire of the old ruling class, and they prepared, they made two attempts to bring him down. The first was a coup in April of 2002, uh, when they arrested him, detained him in an airbase. It lasted 48 hours, and the reason it lasted 48 hours was because the, because the masses came down from the barrios, the poor districts, surrounded the presidential palace and said, we will not move until he is restored to us. To me, that's the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution, the moment when the mass of Venezuelans become the movers and subjects of their own history. And it happened again when um, eight months, nine months later, in December of 2002, the executives of the oil company uh, launched a bosses strike whose aim was to paralyze and actually probably to destroy the oil, uh, the oil economy, the oil, produ oil production. And it was very serious. I mean, for example, they cut all the cables. They took away all the passwords for the for the computers. They um, sabotaged various installations. And once again, masses of people came to protect the installations to defend the industry. These two events start a new process, which is a process in which the mass of people really do become the center of Venezuelan political life. And and Chavez's response to that is to create what are called the missions which are really social welfare programs, health, housing, education. So the money was for the first time going to the benefit of the masses. Now, um, these missions for me, and this is the issue, could have represented the beginnings of a different kind of society because they could be more than missions. They could be organizations of community control, of grassroots democracy, which was Chavez's promise. That's the high point for me, the high point of, of, of Chavez's what he then announced in 2005 as 21st century socialism. That was direct democracy, control from below, really, and economies devoted to the benefit of the majority. That was his great achievement. In 2006, I think the thing then changes, turns in a different direction and becomes complex. And the reason it becomes complex is because, um, you know, we obviously at, at the end of the book, I talk about the legacy of Chavez. Um, and I think there is a double legacy. Um, and uh, the one is really the creation of a new kind of state, but a strong centralized state with himself at the very heart of it. The other legacy or the other current in Chavez is in a sense the opposite, which is the, which is the devolution of power to the base. And when people speak about Chavez, even wealthy, authoritarian bureaucrats who now run the system, they still speak about poder popular, people's, people's power. That was the promise that Chavez made, the devolution of power over time and the transformation of the society so that it was a society that functioned for the benefit of the majority. Um, but these two, these two legacies, these two directions are opposites and, and conflicting. So at the level of discourse, at the level of political hope, there is the idea of a society moving towards control from below. The reality, as I see it, is that increasingly control and power has been centered more and more on a shrinking central bureaucracy, which unfortunately has enriched itself, become corrupt, and to my mind betrayed many of the promises that Chavez represented, warts and all. If, if you read Chavez's documents, they are they are illuminating, they are lyrical, they are, you know, explorations of a new kind of democracy in which people genuinely do control their lives, the mass of people, and that that power and authority derives from below. He cites the commune, you know, 
he cites the Constituent Assembly of Colombia, on which he based his own Constituent Assembly to create a new constitution. So that's one thing. What is it? Why then are we looking at a Venezuela today in which that promise has become rhetorical and not real? And I think when you create a centralized system with however, um, without however uh, uh, authentic and however honest and however um, uh, un uncorrupt is your vision of things, when you create a centralized system, you create new centers of power in a country which is enormously wealthy in oil. It has the world's largest reserves of oil, money floating around in huge quantities, which leads to something which oil, oil analysts have always discussed, which is what they call the Dutch disease, which is that, you know, in a sense, you, you don't create new forms of production, you don't diversify the economy. Instead, you just buy what you need. And that's exactly the situation in Venezuela today, and it's the problem. Because in doing that, you know, the purchaser is powerful, the, 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 the great wealth of the country is centred in a few hands who administer that wealth, and it corrupts. Now, why? Well, I think enormous wealth corrupts, and I think enormous power corrupts. And when the two come together, then that great vision of, of Chavez, which is what won him so much support and interest around the world, the promise of the possibility of a new kind of democracy genuinely run from below, is contradicted by that development. Now, Chavez himself has such a personality and was so charismatic that in a way he could contain the paradox or he could justify it or he could legitimate it for the mass of ordinary people. Without Chavez, the paradox and the contradictions become clearer and clearer.